The Horror of 1518, The Terrifying True Story of the Dancing Plague Chapter 1, The Unseen Spark The year is 1518. The sun beats down on the medieval city of Strasbourg, nestled along the banks of the Ill River. A labyrinth of half-timbered houses leans into narrow cobblestone streets, their gables casting dancing shadows. The air hums with the cacophony of city life, the clang of blacksmiths' hammers, the shouts of merchants hawking their wares, the lowing of cattle being herded to market, and the ceaseless chatter of the townsfolk. The heart of Strasbourg pulses in its bustling marketplace. Here, under a vibrant canopy of colorful awnings, a cornucopia of goods tempts the senses. Merchants peddle exotic spices from distant lands, their aromas mingling with the sweet scent of ripe fruit and freshly baked bread. Women in long skirts and white caps haggle over bolts of cloth, while children dart between stalls, their laughter echoing through the square. Beneath this vibrant facade, however, lies a city simmering with tension. Strasbourg is a city of stark contrasts. Opulence and poverty coexist uneasily. While the wealthy merchants and clergy enjoy lives of comfort and privilege, the majority of the population struggles to eke out a living. The recent harvest has been poor, leaving many families on the brink of starvation. Disease lurks in the shadows, preying on the weak and malnourished. Religious fervor, too, casts a long shadow over the city. The teachings of the Catholic Church permeate every aspect of life, and the fear of divine retribution looms large. The recent spread of Protestantism has only heightened religious anxieties, creating an atmosphere of suspicion and mistrust. It is into this cauldron of social and religious tension that an unseen spark falls, igniting a bizarre and terrifying phenomenon. One sweltering July morning, a woman named Frau Trafia emerges from her home on Rue du Jus des Enfants. She is a wife and mother, known for her quiet demeanor and piety. But today, something is different. A strange energy courses through her veins, an irresistible urge she cannot name. As she steps onto the street, her body begins to move involuntarily. Her feet shuffle, her hips sway, her arms flail. It is a grotesque parody of a dance, devoid of grace or rhythm. Yet Frau Trafia cannot stop. The rhythm compels her, her movements becoming increasingly frantic and uncontrolled. Passersby stop and stare, their faces a mixture of shock, amusement, and alarm. Some laugh, others shake their heads in disapproval. A few, perhaps sensing the woman's distress, try to intervene. But Frau Trafia is beyond their reach, lost in her bizarre and solitary dance. Word of the dancing woman spreads quickly through the city, drawing crowds to the narrow street. Some come out of curiosity, others out of morbid fascination. They gather in clusters, whispering and pointing, their eyes fixed on the gyrating figure in their midst. Among the onlookers are the city's authorities. The bailiff, a stern-faced man with a bushy mustache, watches with growing unease. The parish priest, his brow furrowed in concentration, mutters prayers under his breath. The city physician, a learned man with a reputation for skepticism, observes the spectacle with a keen eye, searching for a rational explanation. As the day wears on, Frau Trophy's movements show no signs of abating. She dances on, oblivious to the growing crowd and the mounting concern of the authorities. The sun climbs high in the sky, casting a merciless glare on the scene. Sweat pours down Frau Trophy's face, her clothes cling to her body, her breath comes in ragged gasps. Yet still she dances. By nightfall, Frau Trophia is no longer alone. A handful of others have joined her, their bodies contorting in similar grotesque movements. The spectacle has taken on a surreal and disturbing quality. The dancers, their faces pale and drawn, seem possessed by some unseen force. Their movements are erratic, their eyes unfocused, their cries a chilling counterpoint to the rhythmic thud of their feet on the cobblestones. The crowd, now swollen to a considerable size, watches in horrified fascination. The laughter has died down, replaced by a palpable sense of unease. The once vibrant marketplace has become a macabre stage for a dance of death. As darkness descends on Strasbourg, the dancing continues. The authorities, bewildered and alarmed, can only watch as the inexplicable phenomenon unfolds before their eyes. The spark has been lit, and the city is about to be consumed by a dance of madness and despair. Chapter 2 The Dance Intensifies 
The days following Frau Trophy's initial outburst brought no respite. Instead, the dancing plague spread through Strasbourg like wildfire, consuming its victims with an insatiable hunger. Within a week, what had started as a solitary spectacle had escalated into a full blown epidemic. Dozens of Strasbourgeois, men and women alike, found themselves swept into the relentless rhythm. It seemed as if the very air itself vibrated with a contagious energy, infecting those who dared to breathe it. The dancers, once confined to a single street, now spilled into the surrounding lanes and alleyways, their writhing figures a grotesque tapestry against the backdrop of the city's half timbered houses. They danced day and night, seemingly impervious to exhaustion or pain. Their movements, initially jerky and uncoordinated, had evolved into a terrifying symphony of contorted limbs and spasmodic gestures. Their eyes, wide and glassy, stared into the abyss of their own madness. Their cries, a chilling chorus of anguish and despair, echoed through the city streets. The physical toll on the dancers was immense. Dehydration ravaged their bodies, their lips cracked and bleeding, their skin stretched taut over their bones. Their muscles strained to the breaking point, quivered with fatigue. Some collapsed from exhaustion, their bodies twitching in the throes of delirium. Others, their minds shattered by the relentless onslaught of the dance, succumbed to madness. Death too claimed its victims. As the days wore on the number of dancers dwindled, their lifeless forms a grim testament to the plague's deadly embrace. Yet for every dancer who fell, another seemed to rise in their place, as if the city itself were a breeding ground for this macabre dance of death. In the face of such an inexplicable phenomenon, the people of Strasbourg turned to their faith for answers. The clergy, eager to assert their authority, offered a ready explanation. The dancing plague was a manifestation of divine wrath, a punishment for the city's sins. From their pulpits, priests and preachers thundered against the wickedness of the people. They warned of the fires of hell that awaited those who had strayed from the path of righteousness. They called for repentance and fasting, urging the faithful to cleanse their souls through prayer and penance. Some preachers went even further, claiming that the dancing plague was the work of the devil himself. They spoke of demonic possession, and the insidious power of evil to corrupt and destroy. They urged the people to resist the temptations of the flesh, and to cling to the teachings of the church. These religious interpretations, while comforting to some, did little to stem the tide of fear and panic that gripped the city. Many citizens, their faith shaken by the relentless onslaught of the plague, began to question the very foundations of their beliefs. The sight of their neighbors, once pious and devout succumbing to the madness of the dance, was a stark reminder of the fragility of human existence. Not everyone, however, accepted the religious explanations at face value. Physicians and scholars, trained in the arts of observation and deduction, sought more rational explanations for the bizarre phenomenon. Some theorized that the dancing plague was a physical ailment, caused by tainted food or water. Others speculated that it was a form of mass hysteria, triggered by stress and anxiety. Still, others suggested that the dancers were suffering from a form of epilepsy or other neurological disorder. The city physician, a man named Paracelsus, was among those who sought a scientific explanation for the plague. He observed the dancers closely, noting their symptoms and the progression of their illness. He examined their bodies, searching for clues in their blood and urine. He consulted with his colleagues, sharing his findings and soliciting their opinions. Paracelsus, however, was not content to simply observe. He believed that the dancing plague could be cured if only the right treatment could be found. He experimented with various remedies, including bloodletting, purging, and the administration of herbal concoctions. He even tried music therapy, hoping that the soothing sounds of lutes and harps might calm the dancer's frenzied movements. Despite his best efforts, Paracelsus's treatments proved ineffective. The dancing plague continued its relentless march, claiming more victims with each passing day. The city of Strasbourg, once a thriving center of commerce and culture, had become a ghost town, haunted by the specter of death and despair. As the plague raged on, the debate between the religious and secular interpretations intensified. The clergy, clinging to their dogma, condemned the physicians and scholars as heretics and blasphemers. The physicians and scholars, in turn, accused the clergy of ignorance and superstition. In the end, 
neither side could offer a definitive answer to the question of why the people of Strasbourg were dancing themselves to death. The dancing plague remained a mystery, a dark chapter in the city's history that would continue to haunt its people for generations to come. Chapter 3 The City's Response The city council of Strasbourg, composed of wealthy merchants and influential clergy, found themselves grappling with a crisis unlike any they had encountered before. The dancing plague, with its relentless spread and devastating effects, had thrown the city into disarray, threatening its very foundations. Desperate to contain the outbreak, the council resorted to a series of increasingly desperate measures. They ordered the immediate isolation of the dancers, hoping to prevent the contagion from spreading further. Makeshift quarantine zones were established in abandoned warehouses and empty barns, where the afflicted were herded together, their cries of anguish echoing through the night. The council also turned to the church for guidance, calling upon priests and exorcists to perform rituals of purification and expel the demons believed to be responsible for the dancing. The air grew thick with the scent of incense and holy water as solemn processions wound their way through the streets their prayers and chants a desperate plea for divine intervention. In their desperation, the council even sought the advice of faraway experts. Messengers were dispatched to neighboring cities and distant lands, bearing letters detailing the strange affliction that had befallen Strasbourg. They sought the counsel of renowned physicians, scholars, and even astrologers, hoping to find a cure for the mysterious plague that had gripped their city. But as the days turned into weeks and the dancing plague showed no signs of abating, panic began to spread through the city. Fear, like a venomous serpent, slithered through the narrow streets, infecting the hearts and minds of the populace. The once bustling marketplace grew silent as merchants shuttered their stalls and fled the city. The rhythmic clang of blacksmiths' hammers fell silent, replaced by the eerie stillness of empty workshops. The laughter of children, once a familiar sound in the city's squares, was replaced by the hushed whispers of fear and uncertainty. Food supplies dwindled as farmers, fearing for their lives, refused to bring their produce to market. Hunger gnawed at the bellies of the poor, who could ill afford to pay the inflated prices demanded by unscrupulous merchants. Disease, fueled by malnutrition and unsanitary conditions, stalked the city streets, claiming the lives of the young and old alike. Rumors like noxious weeds sprouted and spread, fueled by fear and ignorance. Some whispered that the dancing plague was a punishment from God, a retribution for the city's sins. Others claimed that it was the work of witches, who had cast a spell on the city's water supply. Still, others blamed foreigners, accusing them of bringing the plague to Strasbourg. In the midst of this chaos, the city's powerful guilds found themselves caught in a dilemma. As the pillars of Strasbourg's economy, they were responsible for maintaining order and ensuring the continued flow of trade. But the plague, with its devastating impact on the city's workforce and infrastructure, threatened their very existence. The Butcher's Guild, for instance, saw their profits dwindle as the demand for meat plummeted. The Baker's Guild struggled to produce enough bread to feed the hungry masses. The Textile Guild, once the pride of Strasbourg, found their looms idle as weavers succumbed to the plague. The guilds, with their vested interests and competing agendas, struggled to find a common ground. Some argued for stricter measures to control the outbreak, even at the cost of economic disruption. Others, fearing for their livelihoods, resisted any measures that might further damage their businesses. The city council, caught between the demands of the guilds and the needs of the people, found themselves paralyzed by indecision. Their attempts to appease both sides only served to further alienate them, leading to accusations of incompetence and corruption. As the plague continued its relentless march, the social fabric of Strasbourg began to unravel. Trust evaporated, replaced by suspicion and mistrust. Neighbors turned against neighbors, accusing each other of harboring the contagion. The bonds that had once held the city together frayed and snapped, leaving behind a fragmented and fractured community. The dancing plague, it seemed, had not only infected the bodies of its victims, but also the soul of the city itself. It had exposed the fault lines that lay beneath the surface of Strasbourg's seemingly prosperous facade, revealing the deep-seated inequalities and social tensions that threatened to tear it apart. In the face of such adversity, the city of Strasbourg teetered on the brink of collapse. Its streets, once filled with the sounds of commerce and laughter, 
echoed with the cries of the dying and the whispers of fear. Its people, once proud and resilient, were now shadows of their former selves, haunted by the specter of the dancing plague. Chapter 4 Seeking a Cure as the dancing plague continued to ravage Strasbourg, the city's inhabitants clung to the hope of a cure, their desperation fueling a fervent search for remedies both spiritual and earthly. With each failed attempt, the city's desperation grew, leading them down increasingly desperate paths in the pursuit of relief. The first glimmer of hope came in the form of organized pilgrimages to the shrines of St. Vitus. A saint shrouded in mystery, Vitus had become associated with dance due to legends of his refusal to renounce his faith, even when forced to dance before a pagan emperor. In their desperation, the people of Strasbourg saw Vitus as their savior, a beacon of hope in the midst of their suffering. Processions of the afflicted, accompanied by their families and well-wishers, made their way to the nearby shrines, their prayers a symphony of desperation and longing. The journey to the shrines was arduous, a test of faith and endurance. The dancers, weakened by their affliction, stumbled and swayed, their movements a grotesque parody of the religious fervor that fueled their pilgrimage. Yet they pressed on, their eyes fixed on the distant spires of the shrines, their hearts filled with the hope of divine intervention. Upon reaching the shrines, the dancers prostrated themselves before the statues of St. Vitus, their bodies racked with sobs and tremors. They offered prayers and lit candles, their pleas echoing through the sacred spaces. Some even danced before the saint their movements a grotesque offering, a desperate attempt to appease the divine. The pilgrimages, however, brought no relief. The dancers returned to Strasbourg no closer to a cure, their bodies still gripped by the relentless rhythm of the plague. The hope that had sustained them on their journey quickly turned to despair as the reality of their situation set in. In the face of this setback, the city's leaders, desperate for a solution, turned to a more controversial approach. They decided to create a dedicated space for the dancers, a haven where they could indulge their affliction without fear of judgment or ridicule. This dancer's haven, as it came to be known, was a large open space located outside the city walls. It was furnished with raised platforms where musicians played day and night, their melodies fueling the dancers' frenzied movements. The decision to create the dancer's haven was met with mixed reactions. Some saw it as a humane gesture a way to provide comfort and relief to the afflicted. Others condemned it as a folly, a dangerous experiment that would only serve to encourage the spread of the plague. The haven, however, quickly became a magnet for the dancers, who flocked to it in droves. The rhythmic beat of the drums and the hypnotic melodies of the flutes seemed to draw them in, their bodies swaying and convulsing in time with the music. For a time, it seemed as if the haven might actually be working. The dancers, freed from the constraints of their everyday lives, seemed to find solace in their shared affliction. Their movements while still grotesque seemed less frantic, less desperate. But the haven also had its dark side. The constant dancing took a toll on the dancers' already weakened bodies. Exhaustion and dehydration claimed many victims, their lifeless forms sprawled on the dusty ground, a grim reminder of the plague's deadly embrace. Moreover, the haven became a breeding ground for vice and debauchery. As the dancers abandoned themselves to their affliction, they also shed their inhibitions. Drunkenness and promiscuity became commonplace, adding another layer of chaos to the already chaotic scene. As the situation at the haven spiraled out of control, the city's leaders were forced to re-evaluate their approach. They began to experiment with more drastic treatments, hoping to find a way to break the dancers' spell. Bloodletting, a popular medical practice of the time, was one of the first treatments attempted. Physicians, believing that the dancing plague was caused by an excess of blood, made deep incisions in the dancers' veins, allowing their lifeblood to flow freely. But the bloodletting, while temporarily weakening the dancers, did nothing to cure their affliction. Other treatments, equally ineffective and often brutal, were also attempted. Some dancers were subjected to purging a process of forced vomiting and defecation, in the belief that this would rid their bodies of the toxins that were causing their affliction. Others were confined to darkened rooms, their senses deprived in the hope that this would break their obsession with dancing. In some cases, the dancers were even subjected to whipping, their bodies lashed with leather straps in a desperate attempt to drive out the demons believed to be possessing them. 
but these harsh measures only serve to further weaken and demoralize the dancers, pushing them closer to the brink of madness and death. As the weeks turned into months, the dancing plague continued its relentless march, claiming more victims with each passing day. The city of Strasbourg, once a thriving center of commerce and culture, had become a graveyard of hopes and dreams, a place where the living envied the dead. The search for a cure had become a desperate race against time, a struggle for survival in a city consumed by madness and despair. Chapter 5 Aftermath and Reflection As the summer of 1518 waned, the fervor of the dancing plague began to subside. Like a fire that had consumed all available fuel, the frenzy gradually diminished. The numbers of those afflicted dwindled, their movements growing slower, their cries less frequent. The once bustling dancers' haven grew quiet. The platforms that had once throbbed with the rhythmic stomping of hundreds now stood empty, the only sound the melancholic whistle of the wind through the deserted structures. The musicians, their instruments silent, packed their belongings and slipped away, leaving behind a ghost town of unfulfilled hopes and shattered dreams. The city of Strasbourg, battered and bruised, began to pick up the pieces. Merchants tentatively reopened their stalls, blacksmiths rekindled their forges, and the sounds of everyday life slowly returned to the streets. Yet a pall of grief hung over the city, a reminder of the lives lost and the scars that would forever mark its history. The dancing plague had left an enduring mystery in its wake. Despite the frantic search for a cure, no definitive explanation for the phenomenon had been found. The theories proposed by physicians and scholars, while offering some plausible explanations, failed to fully account for the bizarre and terrifying nature of the outbreak. The religious interpretations, while comforting to some, left many with lingering doubts. Was the dancing plague truly a manifestation of divine wrath, a punishment for the city's sins? Or was it something else, a force beyond human comprehension? Centuries later, the dancing plague of 1518 continues to puzzle and intrigue us. Modern science, with its sophisticated tools and methods, has shed some light on the possible causes of the outbreak. One theory suggests that the dancers were suffering from ergotism, a form of poisoning caused by the consumption of ergot-infected rye. Ergot, a fungus that thrives in damp conditions, produces a range of psychoactive compounds that can cause hallucinations, convulsions, and other neurological symptoms. The symptoms of ergotism bear a striking resemblance to those exhibited by the dancers, leading some researchers to conclude that this was the most likely cause of the outbreak. Another theory proposes that the dancing plague was a form of mass psychogenic illness, also known as mass hysteria. This phenomenon, in which a group of people experience similar physical or psychological symptoms without any apparent organic cause, has been documented in various cultures and time periods. According to this theory, the stress and anxiety caused by the harsh living conditions in 1518 Strasbourg, combined with the religious fervor of the time, created a fertile ground for the spread of mass hysteria. The sight of one person dancing uncontrollably could have triggered a chain reaction, with others succumbing to the same irrational behavior. While both of these theories offer plausible explanations for the dancing plague, neither can definitively account for all of the observed phenomena. The mystery of why the people of Strasbourg danced themselves to death in the summer of 1518 remains unsolved a testament to the enduring power of the unknown. The dancing plague, however, has left a lasting legacy. It has become a symbol of the fragility of human reason, a reminder that even the most rational of beings can be swept away by forces beyond their control. The story of the dancing plague has been immortalized in art, literature, and music, its haunting imagery capturing the imagination of generations. It has been the subject of countless scholarly studies, with researchers from various disciplines attempting to unravel its mysteries. Even today, the dancing plague continues to fascinate and intrigue us. Its story is a reminder of the dark side of human nature, of the power of fear and superstition to drive us to irrational acts. It is a cautionary tale, a warning against the dangers of groupthink and the importance of maintaining our critical faculties even in the face of overwhelming adversity. The Dancing Plague of 1518, a bizarre and terrifying episode in human history, serves as a mirror reflecting our own vulnerabilities 
and the ever-present potential for chaos lurking beneath the surface of our seemingly ordered lives. It is a story that continues to resonate with us today, reminding us of the enduring power of the human spirit to both create and destroy.